Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see all of you this morning. Glad that you're here with us to worship today. Uh, we're continuing in our series uh, entitled, a little mini series inside our Messy Church series titled, entitled Messy Marriage. And today we're going to focus on uh, the rigors of marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is where we are. Can somebody just say amen to rigors? <laughs> Uh, All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Stand with me, please, in reverence to the reading of God's Word. Verse 17 is where we begin. Paul writes, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each one in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when, when he was already uncircumcised? He has not become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called to in uncircumcision? He's not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. But if you're also able to become free, do it. For he who is, was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Let's pray. Lord, we just admitted that there's no greater name in all the universe than the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, your name is beautiful. It's wonderful. God, it's powerful. And today we need to experience that power in our lives. Father, marriage is a, a journey. It is a marathon, Lord. And, and during our marriages, there are rigors. There are times when we have some struggles. Father, I pray that you teach us today where we need to keep our attention and our focus. Lord, how we can enjoy marriage as you have planned it for us. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity just to spend a few minutes in your word and bring glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May we see you. Are you content with your life at this moment? You know, it's interesting, most people I talk to are not content where they are at this moment. Every time we chat, maybe it's that people tell me about relationship problems. They'll tell me about money problems. They'll tell me about weight problems. They'll tell me about problems with their kids. See, it always seems like we're thinking about the good life, but we never apply it to our life. We never accept it as true for us. The single want to be married. The married want to be single. Amen. Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> the lady, well, go on. The lady with three kids doesn't want any kids. And the lady who doesn't have any children wants as many as she can get. The employed want time off. The unemployed want time on the job. They want the hours so they can make some money. You see, this is our life today. The Harris Poll actually proves it for us. It did a survey in 2017, discovered that only one in three Americans are very happy. 33% of our population is content where they are right now. The biggest struggle we face is that we find our identity in our work, in our relationships, in our ministry, in our kids, our economic status, maybe our, our physical bodies. That's where we find our identity. We think those factors determine who we are. So if someone walked up to you today and, and just asked a simple question, who are you? How would you respond? 
Who are you? Now, most people respond with, well, I'm a farmer, I'm a lawyer, I'm a teacher, I'm a, we come up with our, a, a job. Why? Because it's become our identity. Maybe a lady might say, well, I'm the mother of three kids. Or maybe someone would say, I'm married to so-and-so. That's what makes me who I am. But I want to ask you that question again. Who are you? And strip away all that stuff we just talked about. Just remove it from the picture. If none of that is important in determining who you are, then who are you? Sadly, I, I fear that some people would look at me and say, well, I'm nothing without work. I'm nothing without my wife or my husband or my children. Or some ministry that I'm involved in. I'm nothing without that. Is that true? You know, the, the Bible gives us a totally different picture. It tells us that if you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that you are the son or daughter of the King of the Universe. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. That's who you are. That's who... I am in Christ. It says that you are a prince or a princess in God's kingdom. You see, it's only when we find our identity there that we can honestly say we are happy or content. Now, some, as they get into this text, would say that Paul is, has left his original context of the single celibate life or the married sexual life to focus on something else. But actually... These verses are a continuation of the previous teachings and help us see why we cannot find our identity in anyone or in anything that is not Jesus. So, where does our identity come from? Where does our identity come from? How do we figure out who we are? Well, first of all, does it come from God? Notice there again in verse 17. He says, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each in this manner, let him walk. You know, this verse kind of reminds me of a, a playwright who is handing out parts for a play. You realize that God is the ultimate playwright? And that he is constantly handing out parts in his play called life. He is our playwright. You see, our discontent comes when we forget who summoned us to live the life we currently live. When our identity comes from God, we enjoy contentment and happiness no matter what's going on around us. Once my family gets here, by the way, almost here. Just a little bit more. Once they get here, you'll kind of notice that we're a little older than the normal parents of 13 and 18 year olds. It took seven years for us to have our first trial. It wasn't like we tried to wait seven years, but God decided that's what he would do. In that time, we learned to be content as a married couple without children. Until God called us to something different. You see, it's not about me. It's about him. He is my. Now, when you meet my kids, some of you haven't met them, some of you have already met them, you'll see that they're you know, pretty well-rounded people now. But when Connor, my son, was uh, a little boy, he was a stinker. <laughs> my wife has said many times, if he'd been born first, there would have been no baby. <laughs> but, you see, no matter how they act, no matter what decisions they make in the future, we know God gave us those kids and called us to be their parents. Now listen, our identity is not found in our children. It's not found in their successes today. It's not found in whatever decisions they make later in life. That's not where our identity is. Our identity is in God, and He is the one that has given us and blessed us with the children that we have. And they are gifts from Him. See, God doesn't want us to find our identity in a spouse or in, a, in children or in a, the home we currently live in. 
He wants us to find our identity in the one who gave us that part of husband or wife, spouse or parent or homeowner. You see, he has summoned us to his service. And that is where our identity is. How many suicides, addictions, and divorces would be avoided if we could grasp that simple truth? My identity is found in the king of all kings. And he assigns my parts in life and summons me to his service. So if God's called you to live a single celibate life, then folks, what he's calling you to do is live it to the fullest. Enjoy life to the fullest. Listen, God wants you to thrive right where he has you right now. Not just to survive where you are hoping for something. Thrive where God has planted you. If God's called you to live a married sexual life, then live it to the fullest. Enjoy the blessing that God has provided. Enjoy what He is, where He has put you at this moment. Stop looking at everyone else and what they've got or supposedly have. And focus your identity upon Jesus Christ. That beautiful, wonderful, powerful name. You see, when we find our identity in God, then He sets us free to fully enjoy life. That he, the life he's given us. We find our contentment in his plan because we know he assigns the parts and he issues the summons to serve. So where do you find your identity? First of all, do you, does it come from God? Is your identity in him? Or does it come from past problems and future fears? Notice he continues there in verse 18. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He's not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He's not to be circumcised. Now, think about the question he's asking. He's talking about a past experience, either they're circumcised or uncircumcised. And then he's talking about the fact that sometimes our past actually causes us to struggle in the future. He delves into their past to help them discern if that is where their identity comes from. Listen, many Jews found all of their identity in circumcision. It was the sign of the covenant with God in the Old Testament. And it, it caused them to live a certain way. So they ate a specific diet because of circumcision. They treated their spouse a certain way because of circumcision. They worshipped in a specific manner because of circumcision. It was their identity. But Paul tells us that Circumcised should stay circumcised, tells the uncircumcised to stay uncircumcised, which clearly befuddled the Jews but had to be a relief to the Gentiles. <laughs> Paul's point is that their identity is not in circumcision or the lack thereof, but in the call of God upon their lives. So what in your past has ruled your present? Where have you found your identity over the years? My grandfather grew up in the Depression era. And that past had an incredible impact upon his future. I remember I was a little kid. And uh, suddenly my grandfather starts yelling. He's walking through the house yelling, Where's number four? Where's number four? I'm a little kid. I'm like, where for four? One, two, three. It's right there. Where? My grandmother looked at me. She was smiling. She just looked at my confused face and she said, your, grand, your grandfather counts or numbers his underwear because he's afraid. <laughs> oh, it gets better. Because he's afraid I might steal them. <laughs> Depression there. It's the way they thought. When he passed away, my family spent some time helping my grandmother to kind of get prepared to be single. Try to get some of his stuff out and, and so she could just kind of spread out and, and, and enjoy the life God called her to. And as we're going through his dressers and even shoes and coat pockets, we continually found money rolled up really tightly. 
Sometimes it was stuck in a, a, a gum wrapper or in a little tin that would have had candy in it. We found it in his shoes, in his pockets, all in the place. We found enough money to pay my grandmother's property taxes for a whole year. <laughs> but that's what we're talking about. You see, the past, his past problems impacted his present. And I will say to you that it caused lots of problems with his family. It caused incredible problems with his children. You see, that identity, that depression identity created that. But hey, pay the property taxes. Past problems can create identity problems, and so can future fears. He continues on uh, in our text there, verse 19. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Now I want to stop there for a second, because I fear that there are people who would read that, especially in Paul's day. Jews who would read that, they would, they would suddenly think, well, how do I continue on? I mean, this is my life. Circumcision has been everything to me. And how now am I supposed to find any identity? If you say circumcision, circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. How could an Orthodox Jew face the future? If his identifying moment in life was circumcision. I suspect those words created great fear. Because their identity was found in something that was now nothing. Did you hear that? Their identity was found in something that is now nothing. It's not just true for the Jews. I'm afraid it's true for us as well. We find our identity in something, and then that something is gone. And guess what? Our identity is with it. We, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to act. We don't know what, what's next. You know, if you faced any kind of abuse or been attacked by someone, then you, you know how easy it is to find our identity in that. And while that's a past problem, it has a huge impact upon the future. And how you live, where you go, what you do, because of that past experience. It creates a fear for the future. So where is your identity? Where does it come from? Paul clearly tells his readers, the only concern they should have for the future is they're ready to obey Whatever God reveals in his word. Notice that again in the verse 19. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. This is what God has called us to. Our identity is found in God. Therefore, our future is consumed with obeying his commandments for life. And if our identity is found anywhere else, in anything else, then past problems, future fears, will produce isolation, heartache, and a constant sense of loss, whether single or married. So, think about it. Where does your identity come from? Does it come from God? Or does it come from past problems, future fears? Now, the second question we have to ask then is, where will that identity take us? Where will that identity take us? If we find our identity in God and God alone, not in our spouse, not in our home, not in our children, not in the car we drive, not in the job we have or the money in our bank account. But if we find our identity in God, then where does that take us? In the first place, he tells us it takes us to new and exciting places. Look at verse 21. Were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. But if you're able also to become free, rather do that. So Paul tells those who served while, or who were saved, I'm sorry, while, while serving as Slaves, not to sweat their current social standing. You might know that slaves in the Roman Empire were the lowest of the low in culture. They, they were considered be, be below anyone else in their culture. And we also know that they were treated more like indentured servants and, and less like slaves. Paul's concern is not that they make more money or enjoy a better social standing. The apostle want these, wants these people to know that God has a rich and wonderful plan for their life 
right where they are. Right where they are. What was that plan? Well, for the slaves, we read it a little while ago in Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. They were to learn to obey their masters, but they do so out of obedience to God. Not working for a master any longer, working for the master and serving for him. You see, that was the plan that God had for slaves. Find your identity in Christ, not in slavery, and it'll change everything about your work and service. Now, I want you to notice that Paul does not mean that those who find their identity in Jesus lose their drive and determination to succeed. That's not what he says. It simply means Jesus brings order and reason to that drive and compassion for those who are facing it as well. He tells the slaves, if you got an opportunity to be free, be free. If, if God decides to change where you are in life, so be it. Be free. Enjoy the life that God has given to you. His point is this. If God opens the door for you to make more money, or he opens the door for you to get that, that new position at work, if he opens the door for a part-time job to get out of the house, if he opens the door, then folks, walk through it. Go to those new and exciting places that God has for you. Don't just think, oh, I'm stuck. No. Wherever you are, live it to the fullest. And when God opens another door, walk through the door and live that to the fullest as well. That is finding our identity in Christ. And not in our circumstances or possessions. And if God does not open that door, then be content where he has you right now. I, I, I think you would agree with me that even the healthiest couples have little rifts every once in a while. I know some of you've got perfect marriages. No rifts ever. I don't even try to say that. We do. We have rifts at our house. Usually some issue comes up and we have a little rift and then we have to work it out. Now, why is it? Why is it that a rift, when a rift comes up in our house between my wife and I, why is it that we understand this is a forever? We gotta, we gotta, we gotta work this out. We can't just continue on angry at each other. Why? Because our identity is found in God, not in each other. You see, we know sometimes we just don't like each other. We're just <laughs> mad about something, don't care for each other. But we know what God has called us to, our identity is in him. Now, if my wife gets here and you start telling her about all these things that I've told you, <laughs> there's probably going to be another riff, so you know, <laughs> take that through before you uh, bring that out. Uh, I know. So when Jesus is our identity, then we already know that marriage is a marathon, not a sprint. And that we're going to have hard times. Things are going to happen. But it's forever, so we've got to work it out. You see, when we find our identity in God, he takes us to new and exciting places. But he also takes us to new and exciting possibilities. Notice verse 22. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. Now, think that through. Jesus changes the way we identify with every situation. He tells a, a, a slave, listen, you're the Lord's free man. And he tells a free man, you are a slave of Christ. <laughs> see, a Christian in slavery can suddenly see all new possibilities for his or her future. Why? Because he is the Lord's free man. Sometimes we allow culture to define what success and what is not. It's when I find my identity in God, suddenly, I don't care what the culture is. I want to be successful in His eyes. I want to bring honor to Him. So, be open to those new possibilities 
that he might give. Now the question is, is it possible to enjoy being a slave? <laughs> if we're slaves, is it possible to enjoy that? You know, it's interesting, in Roman culture, many of the slaves, um, would, when they were set free, some of them would actually stay with their masters. They had, a, you know, a comfort level there. They were settled. They were taken care of. <coughs> Paul repeats a phrase here that uh, comes from, verse, from chapter 6 as well. He says, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Bought with a price. That payment sets us free to identify with him and not with the pressures and problems and persecutions of life. Folks, even when we find our identity in God, we struggle with issues beyond our control. We, are, However, do not have to become slaves to those issues. You hear that? You don't have to be a slave to the problems you're facing right now. You don't have to live there. You can live in knowing your God has a plan for your life, and He is not going to fail in that plan. It might not go like you want it to go, or like I want it to go, but it's going to go just like he wants it. So my identity is found not in me, not in my possessions, not in my family. It is found in Christ. You see, the rigors of a single celibate life and the married sexual life are real. Are real. And as Christ followers, we no longer have to blow from place to place like the wind. Instead, we find who we are in Christ. And settle where God has us until he opens the new world. I mentioned to you a few moments ago that my family will be here by the end of February if everything continues to go as it is. But I want to say this to you. That was a step of faith. That was us saying, God, you have called us to faith Baptist Church. Not just me, but us to faith Baptist Church. Our identity is not in the, the money we're going to have to spend to make that happen. Our identity is not in, in you know, finance and being tight for a little while. That's not our identity. Our identity is found in God. He is the one that directs our steps. And so if he has called us, then we need to be here. And he has now opened the door for that to happen. Understand identity. It can only come from God. If you truly want to be 